Welcome to Non-Gendered Fitness, where we explore health, fitness, transitioning, and queer life from beyond the binary. Proudly brought to you by Fearless Movement Collective, the home of queer fitness and health. And here's your host, Bowie Stovar. Hi there, welcome to Non-Gendered Fitness. This is episode 12. My name is Bowie Stovar. My pronouns are they, them. And I'm super stoked to have you join me today. This show is recorded on the stolen lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. Sovereignty never was and never will be ceded. And I pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. Welcome back, friends. Today, we're going to be exploring the ways different movements and types of training influence our bodies. We're going to check out some of the most common movements and sessions that are showing up on socials at the moment. And we're going to break them down a little. So by the end of the show, you'll have an understanding of how certain movements support our bodies, the difference in training sessions and their influence on your physical outcomes, and how to do some basic movements safely by following some simple cues. So there's a lot online at the moment when it comes to getting active at home, but knowing why you should be doing the sessions is important. See, there's not so much information out there sharing with you about what particular movements do to our bodies. And I think that's a really big thing because different training sessions will give you different results. I know some of the mis- some of the most common misconceptions that I've heard out there is people saying like, I don't want to train because it'll make me bulky when it actually takes a particular type of training session to gain muscle mass. Uh, or alternatively, other people saying, I don't want to So I don't want to do cardio because it'll make me too skinny when actually cardio doesn't necessarily have to make people like too lean, especially for people who are looking at gaining some muscle mass. Cardio does not actually make you lean if you do it properly. So these are some common misconceptions that are out there. You see, when we look at training, there are some different ways that you can train and people have different goals with them. People will train to gain bulk, muscle power or muscle strength, muscle endurance, cardio endurance, and they all look very different when it comes to how a training session is going to be laid out because of that. Now, when it comes to the online sessions that I've seen a lot popping up, they're very much focused more on just getting active to develop. If we're going to put it down to an outcome from it, it would be developing cardio endurance and muscle endurance because there are a lot of sessions based around just body weight activities that are high intensity, which get your heart rate up, get your blood pumping, which increases your cardio capacity and gets your muscles really working, gets them tired, which helps to develop muscle endurance helps to develop some muscle strength. No matter what style of training that you do, you are going to end up building some sort of lean muscle mass. It just depends on the extent of how much muscle growth you have is going to be influenced by the type of training that you're doing. So what do you want to get from moving your body? See, I've seen a bunch of training sessions out there, which is super cool. I just like shout out to every trainer out there who's putting stuff out there for all the folks who are stuck at home, who want to move their body in some way just to feel a little bit better because we all know that movement can improve our moods. It can improve how we feel and think. It can improve the way our body functions. There's so much stuff that movement can do that's really positive. And at a time when there's a whole lot of stressful shit going on, it's really rad to see so many folks just giving. It's really inspiring. See, training has been romanticized as being this incredible thing that can fix all of your problems though. And that's something that I've seen a lot of. I've worked with people who have said, you know, once I'm more muscular or once I'm fitter or once I lose some weight, then I'll be happy or then I won't feel like I do now. And while getting active and changing your body can help to get you feeling like better about yourself, it does improve self-confidence. It does improve your mood it improves the way you think about yourself there's a lot of positives however it only does so much and it doesn't necessarily fix all your problems and if you're thinking that uh, say getting leaner is going to fix everything then it's going to be a hard truth when you realize that it's not going to fix everything that's going on inside because there's some outside changes that don't fix the stuff that's going on inside so knowing what you want when it comes to training is going to be a great start And for someone who says, you know, I want to become more muscular or I want to become fitter, that's awesome. And it's a perfect place to start. It really is. But knowing why you want to become more muscular, knowing why you want to be fitter, this is what's going to keep you going. And it's really important to have an understanding, not just of 
what the outcomes you want to have, but why you want to have them. And I think it's it can take a bit of time to figure that out. So when it comes to movement, you're going to get very different physical outcomes based on the way that your training is set up. And if you've got particular goals in mind, then you are going to need to kind of figure out what the best way to train is to help you reach those goals. I understand at the moment that things are a little bit limited uh, <laughs> as to what you can access, but there definitely are. If you're someone who's very motivated to really reach a certain goal right now, there are those trainers out there. If you're someone who just wants to get active just because you're stuck at home and it's like, ugh, fucking stuck at home, then any of these online sessions that are out there are going to be absolutely brilliant for you and really be beneficial just in getting your heart rate up, getting you moving, and just helping you feel better because you're not sat down at home and like just feeling sluggish or feeling tired because moving can actually help to improve your energy. So you can do the same move, let's say a squat, for example, and you can get very different outcomes long term from that doing doing that movement, dependent on the way you do it. So what do I mean by that? So let's say that you were going to do a squat using a weight that was moderately heavy with higher reps. So you repeat the squat a high amount of times, let's say around 100 reps, or you use a really heavy weight with a squat and you go low reps, but either way that you do it, whether it's moderately heavy and high reps or heavy and low reps with only a short 60 second break, then you're going to build muscle mass because you're going to develop lactic acid in your muscles. Now, lactic acid is a byproduct of energy synthesis and it stimulates growth hormones. So when you're wanting to build muscle mass, you want to get a lot of lactic acid build up in your muscles. That's how you build muscles. And that's why we have a short break with 60 seconds because it doesn't allow our muscles time to flush that lactic acid out of our system. So if you're going to do moderately heavy weight with low sets and low reps, so let's say five sets of five reps, but with a long break of like three minutes between each set, then you're going to build muscle strength because that three minute rest allows lactic acid to leave the muscles. And when lactic acid is allowed to leave the muscles and then we repeat again, that's how we develop muscle strength. But if you were going to use a light weight or body weight and go for, say, maximum sets and reps within a certain time frame, then you're more inclined to build muscle endurance because you're going for a high use of muscles, but it's not at any sort of maximal or close to maximal effort. So you're able to last longer because energy synthesis doesn't build up lactic acid so quickly. So you're going to end up with muscle endurance. Now, all of these ways will lead to muscle growth to some extent, but the, well, the key point here is that the amount of weight, the amount of rest you have, are all going to influence that overall outcome. Now, the reason I'm using a squat is because some of the most common movements that I've seen around online at the moment include the squat. And, and it's one that we're all familiar with, I think, which is why it's so commonly seen in a lot of the training sessions that I've seen around. Along with squats, there's push-ups or a variation of them, abdominal exercises, deadlifts or some sort of variation. Any movement can be done with body weight um, and can be made quite challenging by just slowing it down because the longer you're allowing tension in your muscles, the more work they're going to be doing. See, all of these movements help develop full body strength in some way, but more importantly, these movements are all key in developing postural strength. And see, that's the reason why we see these types of movements so commonly, because postural strength is like super important. It's what we need to help our body stay upright as we age, because age-related frailty comes about from a loss in postural strength uh, as one of the key factors. And when we lose postural strength, we're more inclined to slips, trips, and falls, which lead to broken bones. Because as we age, we also have a reduction in bone density and muscle mass. So this combined can lead to the age-related frailty. But if we stay more active, if we develop our postural strength, so we develop um, the muscles in our butts with deadlifts, we develop the muscles in the fronts of our legs with squats. We develop the muscles in our backs with push-ups and the backs of our arms with push-ups. We develop some abdominal strength through crunches or through sit-ups. We, we hit these key areas so it can reduce the loss of muscle mass as we age by moving our bodies and, and keeping our muscles working. And it can also reduce the loss in bone density that we experience as we age as well. So when we keep active, we're giving our bodies the best chance to slow that aging process and therefore 
reduce our risk of age-related frailty and slips, trips and falls. It's a good motivator to be active. (laughs) So how can you figure out why you want to train and begin to practice movement safely as well? See, taking the time to truly think about why you want to move is super important as it's going to guide you on how to move your body. And as I've explained, there's a few different ways that you can do training to get certain outcomes. And I know that it's not commonly spoken about. It's just like you see these end results of these really either like muscular people or really lean people. And it's like, you just want to be like this, but there's not necessarily a lot of talk into how to get that if that's what you're going for. One. Two, like why does that have to be the outcome? (laughs) It doesn't make sense. You know, everyone's going to have a different reason to train and a different outcome that they're looking for. Let's I'll use myself for an example. See, before I started training, I wanted to be strong. Like for as long as I can remember, I've wanted to be strong. Uh, I've wanted to look strong too. So I want to be strong so that I can do anything that I want to do without help. Because I have a I have a big desire to be independent and be self-reliant. So for myself, having strength allows me to do the everyday things in life or anything that I put myself to do in life and be able to do it if it's something that requires physical strength. (laughs) Key point there. (laughs) But I do a lot of physical stuff and that has been my main motivator since I started training. Before that, I spent a long time struggling with who I was because I had this idea in my head that I wanted to be strong, I wanted to be capable, I wanted to be self-reliant, but I was also drinking excessively. I had a really unhealthy relationship with alcohol I was overweight at my heaviest. I was 93 kilos, which is like 205 pounds. I was like this for a long time, for a a big chunk of my adult life. And it wasn't until I actually got real sick in the stomach and spent about six months not really being able to eat and then about another six months being scared to eat. So I spent about a year not really eating a lot and I lost a bunch of weight. I lost like 23 kilos, which is 50 pounds. And even though it made me like a bunch leaner and my had this image in my head for a long time, that, you know, if I was leaner, I'd, I'd feel heaps better. It didn't actually change how I saw myself or how I felt about myself. And that was a hard realization because I thought it would somehow, somehow, you know, like, oh, look, I, I look stronger now. It's like, no, now I just look really skinny because I didn't eat anything. And it was quite unhealthy. I ended up with a, a really unhealthy relationship with food and I started drinking even more. So it was a really terrible combination. <laughs> I didn't actually do anything to support my body, even though I'd kind of wished and wished and wished. It took me five years after I had after I got sick and like slowly got better. It took me five years before I actually chose to become active and start doing something that uh, was in, in line with what I was actually thinking that I wanted to do or how I wanted to be or the, the way I wanted to see myself. So when I began training... I had that goal of being strong in my head. It was like, it was the, one of the biggest things that I started. It's like, okay, I'm actually going to do it. I want to be strong. I want to look strong. And like when I started training, I hadn't planned on becoming a trainer. <laughs> that was, that, that came afterwards. So I just thought, yes, finally, I'm going to feel the way I've always wanted to feel. I'm going to look the way I want to look. I'm going to be, you know, I'm going to be this super strong, like muscular person. And that's, and that was how I kind of had this image in my head of myself. And I was super privileged because I met my trainer who turned out, uh, in my opinion, to be like this super amazing human. It was like Wonder Woman. She'd been a trainer for nine years when I met her. She was also, so not only a, uh, a kettlebell instructor, but she was a qualified chef and a master diver. And I'd never met anyone who was as strong as she was. And it blew my mind. And she was in her mid fifties when I met her and started training with her. I was just like, who is this person? They're amazing. I will become that strong. And that became my goal. I started working as hard as I could to become as strong as Sigrun. Now it took a lot. I'm not going to lie. I didn't like, I had this idea in my head that I was the shit and I was strong and I was all these things. And I tell you what, when I started working with kettlebells, my glob did I realize very quickly that I was nowhere near as great as what I thought I was. (laughs) I I was so uncoordinated and I wasn't overly strong even though I thought I was and kettlebells are a challenge because you can't just pick one up and start doing a certain movement like you've got to earn the skill it takes a lot of time it takes so much coordination so much coordination that I did not have 
And to this day, I have never met anyone who has taken as long as I took to learn um, um, the basic kettlebell swing. And uh, it really, it was a testament to kind of how far off I was with what I thought my abilities were. And it's funny now, uh, but, but at the time, it actually made me more determined because I was like, I will not let this lump of metal with a handle get the better of me. I can't get a stronger cigarette if this stupid kettlebell won't do what I want. So I started like really working. I bought my own kettlebells. I'm like, I'm going to, I'm going to show you kettlebell. And it started just, it, it. In, inspired me and the way Sigrid could do things inspired me and it really helped develop my passion for moving my body and also learning about how my body worked and learning about how my body worked inspired me to start learning about how other people's bodies worked because every person's body is different and we all have different capabilities we will have different physical abilities we will have different physical limitations even though we're technically constructed the same way there are so many differences that our bodies have and the way our joints move and they are influenced by if we're injured sometimes we're just born with joints that move differently from other people there's so many different things out there and I became just inspired to learn how all bodies could move and I've worked with so many people and I feel really lucky for that because I've worked with so many people with so many different physical abilities and it's and learning from them and learning how to become uh, better at teaching people how they can move their bodies in different ways and learning how I can think of movements differently to help other people move in particular ways and it's all been such a such a fun thing. <laughs> I really love it. It's it's just so cool to see people realize that they can do something that they never may have thought possible because they've seen a standard way of doing things and think, well, that's the way it has to be done. But not realizing it's like, no, well, there's no rules when it comes to moving our bodies. How can we learn to move in ways that suit us individually? And it is one of the most amazing things about all our bodies. We can all move in ways doesn't have to be standard cookie cut, you know, the fitness industry says that we must do standard squats and things like this and blah, blah, blah. It's like, no, fuck off with your really inflexible views on what movement is. Our bodies can move in so many different ways. And some of our ability for like our limbs to move more than other people's like limbs, like our joints can move in greater ranges of movement than other people. You've got contortionists and stuff like that. Like not everyone can do that stuff. These people have a genetic gift that allows their bodies to move and stretch in certain ways. And it could be from because of joint flexibility. It could be from really stretchy ligaments. Like there's all of these different things because no two bodies are the same and no two bodies can be expected to move the same. And in conclusion... <laughs> learning to move my body really inspired me to learn to understand myself better but learn to understand how everyone's bodies can move better and my point is being inspired and being passionate is really important when it comes to knowing why we want to move because it's what keeps us going so it's really important to take the time and ask yourself like why do you want to move and answering really honestly because training it takes time. It's a long-term thing. You can't just kind of do things a couple times and expect things to happen quickly. Training is very much not like that. <laughs> Training takes, it takes years of practice. And so knowing why you want to do certain things is going to make that time that you're moving your body more enjoyable. Because if it's, if you're not enjoying it, I don't think there's a point in doing it. You've got to find the ways that you can move and do stuff that that is really fulfilling for you. And that may not be a standard way and that's okay because there is so many different ways that you can move. But being really honest about what you want your outcome to be, not just physically, but it's like, how do I want to look physically? How do I want to feel in my body? How do I want to feel emotionally? You know, how do I want to be as a person? Who can I be as a person? Because all of these things can be influenced by the way that we look like and it's super shit because society's like well you've got to be you know lean and muscular and if you're that then you're the pinnacle of health and you're accepted in society and you're deemed to be attractive when in reality it's a crock of shit and any person can have any sort of physicality and have so many unique abilities taking strong people for example they're not lean 
they've got what they like to call power bellies. You know, they've got a big, they've got a big belly. They're not, they're not small people. You know why? Because it takes weight to shift weight. Because when you're trying to shift something that weighs more than you, you want to weigh as much as you can. So you have enough strength and force to put behind that to shift the weight. So this idea that being lean or being skinny or being like this low percentage of body fat is the ideal is crap. It depends on what you want to do with your body. If you want to just look lean and muscular, then sure. If you don't want any practical application for that, that's great. And you, there are people out there like that. They just want to look that way and that's fine. But being lean and being muscular doesn't not doesn't necessarily mean a person is healthy because to get that lean, you've got to have a really low calorie intake. So you're, you're in a calorie deficit. You're restricting your diet. You're training, you know, really ex- like not excessively, but like you're training a lot. There's a lot of dedication and time that goes into looking that way. And for those people, like it takes a lot of equipment and, you know, that's a pretty big thing. And if that's what works for them, it's worked for them. But just because you're lean and muscular doesn't mean that you've got great muscle endurance. doesn't mean that you've got strength. There's people I, like you see them, the big beef case are like super muscly, really ripped people. They, they, they can be what I like to call all show and no go because because they look muscular doesn't mean that they can actually do anything functional with that. doesn't mean their bodies actually function well. There are so many people who it would be considered that pinnacle of health and fitness because they're lean and muscular who can't move their bodies at all because they have so many imbalances and asymmetries in their body that they're actually not functional. See, the, one of the most important things that I believe comes from movement is a body that can move the best way that it can. And that's going to be different for everyone. If a body can't move as well as it can, then it doesn't matter how much muscle you grow, that's not going to be helpful for you. So it's all about moving our bodies well in the ways that we can that are going to benefit us the most. So really taking that time to think about why you want to do things and answering honestly, it's going to have a big influence. And not buying into stereotypes because it can be really easy to think that what image is sold by the fitness industry is how we all need to be or how we all want to be. And I do acknowledge that my physicality does look a certain way. And you may be saying, well, fuck Bowie, what about you? You know, you're someone who is leaner. You're someone who is muscular. You're, how are you not personifying this image from the fitness community? And I get it. I am not in any way saying that my physicality is the ideal physicality. It is for me. And I do move in certain ways to achieve the physique that I have. And it is possible for many people to achieve what I've achieved. And it takes time. And for myself, I've been motivated and inspired by a lot of different things that help me to achieve where I'm at. But just because I look this way doesn't mean that I think everyone should. Because I think each person can choose to look and be and feel and move any way that they like. And what works for me is not going to work for everyone. And there is and there is not a standard. I do not believe that just because I look this way that I think everyone should. And which is why I talk about finding the ways that help each person who wants to move to move. How do they want to move? How do they want to feel? It's not about me. It's not about how I look comparing it to how someone else looks because I've been in totally different circumstances. I've been someone who has been overweight, who has had some really challenging relationships with alcohol, with food. And I've walked through my own shit and my journey has gotten me to where I am. And if I can help other people on their own journeys to achieve their goals and become that person that they want to be and look the way that they want to look, then that's what matters. And fuck social beauty standards and fuck the opinion from the fitness industry that there's only one way to look because there is not. There is definitely not. So (laughs) on that, let's say you've found a great online session to follow. Bonza, yes, that is what we want. So how do you know once you've found that thing, if the movements you're doing are safe? Because if we get given a program that is like a little clip and it's like do 12 squats and do 10 push-ups and do five star jumps and then do a 30 second plank, you know, you get this little list of things and it's just like in in a little image. 
of writing and you don't get any sort of demonstration. You can be like, fuck, how do I know if this is if this is safe? I'm doing these movements and they feel really weird. Does it really weird feel bad? It's like, well, no, most of the time if you do when you first start moving, everything feels weird because we're moving in a lot of ways that we're not used to. And that's okay. It's okay for movement to feel weird. Weird generally means you're doing it right. But just to clarify some things up, let's break down some of the most common movements that I have seen online at the moment so that you can feel that you're doing them safely and and with confidence. Let's look at the squat first. Now with the squat, you want to start with your feet somewhere around hip width. It can be wider, but not narrower. Hip width or wider with your toes facing slightly outwards. One of the biggest things with the squat is as you lower yourself down to it, you want to make sure your hips and your knees are bending at the same time. Bendy bits must move together. And this can take practice and it can take coordination. I mean, the concept of it, when you say it, it's like, yeah, whatever, boy. It's not hard. No, yeah, it can be. <laughs> it can actually be quite a challenge to get your knees and hips to bend together. So just take it slow. Now you want to make sure that as you're bending your knees, your hips are going to push back slightly, but they're going to go down towards the ground. Now you want to make sure that your feet stay flat on the ground. So imagine you want your knees to come forward a little bit, no further forward than the tips of your toes. Now, as you're bending your knees and hips at the same time, (laughs) what you want to do is make sure you keep your chest up because one of the biggest problems comes when you let your chest drop too far forward. And this can happen because our brain thinks just because our head is moving that the rest of our body is moving, but that's not always the case. So what can happen is you can be not bending your knees and hips much at all, but instead be bending forward and letting your chest drop forward. And your brain's like, yeah, I'm doing these. And the bottom half of your body is like, I'm not sure if we're doing these. And the top half is like, oh, I'm moving. So I don't know what's going on with you. And (laughs) this kind of coordinated process can sometimes take some time. So to make sure that we're not tricking our brain into thinking it's doing more than what it actually is by moving the wrong parts, we want to make sure we keep our chest up. And the easiest way to do this, before we bend our knees and hips, once we're standing there, our feet are wider than our hips or at hip width, toes slightly out. So what you're going to do is you're going to bring your hands up to in front of your chest, elbows are bent, just sat beside your ribs. You're going to link your fingers and you're going to hold them just in front of you, like just at collarbone height. Now, as you bend your hips and knees at the same time, pushing your hips back slightly and lowering your butt towards the floor, you're going to keep your hands out in front of your chest. So as you squat down, let your arms move up and keep your hands at that chest height that they are when you first start the squat from standing. So keeping your hands out in front of your chest only will stop your chest from falling down. If you let your arms come down low, it's going to pull your whole torso down. You don't want that because when we let our torso drop too much, it starts to overload our lower back. And that's just not great because we don't want to end up kind of twinging something. So chest stays up. Now, if you've got your hands in front of your chest and as you squat down, you're keeping your hands at chest height, but you're finding that you're still having your chest drop forward or you're finding that your heels are lifting up then what you can do is take a chair like a dining chair pop it behind you and set yourself up again so feet hip width or wider toes slightly outwards hands in front of your chest but instead of trying to squat down as low as you can you're gonna bend your knees and hips at the same time push your hips back a little bit and imagine you're going to sit down on the chair, but you're not going to sit. You're going to lower yourself down until your butt just lightly touches that chair. And then you're going to stand back up from there. Now, as you lower yourself down, you want to breathe in. And as you stand up, you want to breathe out. Now let's go to push-ups. Push-ups are a super all body movement. They're really quite challenging. <laughs> and seeing people do a full push-up and like pump them out, it looks pretty badass. And it's a cool thing to strive for, but they do require some time and practice. And one of the most important things you do when you start a push-up is to make sure that your hands are under your shoulders. Uh, I've seen a lot of people, they're inclined to bring them out wider than their shoulders and then when they lower themselves down, they kind of, they're going to collapse their shoulders a little bit and it's actually quite unhealthy because their shoulders aren't made to support load on the particular angle that they go on when their hands are out really wide. So you want to make sure hands are under your shoulders always. 
You feed it together. Now, here's the secret ingredient. You want to squeeze your butt. That is the key to a push-up. Squeeze the butt. Why? Because it stops the middle from bending. If we bend in the middle, push-ups become really hard. (laughs) So once you've got your butt squeezed, you're going to bend your elbows, but keep them close to your ribs, as close as you can to your ribs. And you're also going to keep your chin forward. So your eyes are going to be looking forward. Don't let your head drop because letting your head drop it becomes like a dead weight. And then you're kind of dragging your body and your saggy head back up. Man, it's no fun. I've, <laughs> trust me, <laughs> I have learned the hard way. And you want to make sure as you lower down and pushing back up that you're keeping your butt squeezed the whole time. Now, only lower yourself down to as low as you can go. If you get to the bottom and you get stuck, you've probably lowered yourself a little bit too far down for where you're at right now. And that's okay because you can just bend your knees and lower yourself down to the ground safely and pop yourself back up and try again. There's nothing wrong with doing the the down phase of a push-up and then dropping to your knees to push yourself back up to straight. So down on your toes, up on your knees. That's a perfectly acceptable way to start. Oh, acceptable. My gosh, who am I? <laughs> it's, a, it's a really cool way to start developing the strength if you're at the point where you can control yourself lowering down, but not quite have the strength to push yourself back up on your toes yet. Now, when you lower yourself down, you want to breathe in. And as you push yourself up, you're going to breathe out. Now, I will touch on some variations of the push ups a little bit later because there are quite a few other than the down on the toes, up on the knees that can help you build to that point. So let's check out some ab work now. See, so sit-ups and crunches are two of the most common things that I see around, and they're like they're pretty basic movements. A sit-up being where you lay flat on your back, knees bent, feet planted on the floor, and you simply sit your chest half up to your knees, where a crunch is kind of a half version of that, where you lay on your back, feet planted on the floor, knees bent, and you will re- usually reach your wrists up to, uh, to your knee height. Either one of those um, will do a pretty similar thing. Now, the biggest thing I see wrong with people doing it wrong, the, the biggest mistake I see people making that kind of make um, sit up that makes sit ups really challenging for people. There's two things. The biggest one being that they'll put their hands behind their head, and then as they sit up, they're going to try and pull themselves up by the back of their head. They'll be gripping the back of their head for dear life and dragging themselves up from the head. And our heads aren't made for that. <laughs> our heads are not made to support our body weight or lift our body weight. So we want to be really mindful of that. So when we set ourselves up for a sit up, the best thing to do is once you're on your back, feet are planted on the floor, knees are bent, rest your hands on the fronts of your legs. Then what you're going to do (laughs) is take your chin and tuck it down to your collarbone. And this is going to keep you from pulling yourself up by your head. Now you're going to tuck your chin and then you want to imagine that you're getting lifted up from the center of your chest. Let your chest lead. If you let your chest lead, your head and neck will be safer and they won't get that strain or they won't get that twinging. So it's really important. Lead with the chest. Now, as you sit up, you're going to let your hands either slide up. If you're doing a crunch, you're going to slide your hands up until your wrists touch your knees. If you're doing a full sit up, you slide your hands up. Keep going until you've got your chest to your knees. And then you're going to lower yourself back down. Now with a sit-up or with a crunch, you want to breathe out as you're raising your shoulders up off the ground. And you want to breathe in as you're lowering yourself back down. Finally, we're going to look at deadlifts. Now these are a bit different from squats. They're kind of similar. There's quite finer detail between a squat and deadlift. The biggest difference being that a deadlift is a hip hinge, which means that You'll bend your hips and knees the same as a squat, but when you lower yourself down, you push your hips back. So when you squat, your your butt goes down to the ground. When you deadlift, your butt goes back. You hinge back like you're breaking in the middle, but you want to make sure your knees are bending with that. So the setup for a deadlift is feet under your hips. Now, that's a big difference as well. You don't want to go a wider sense. There are some deadlifts that are wider, like a sumo deadlift, but we're, we don't need to look at that. We're going to look at a standard kind of deadlift setup, which is feet under the hips. And that's really important because it helps our hip hinge. It helps that hinging, that pushing of the hips back. 
toes are going to be facing forwards. You're going to stand up nice and tall. You're going to dip your knees and you're going to push your hips back and your knees are going to be what brings your hips lower to the ground. You're not going to let your butt lead the way down like you do in a squat. You want to be really mindful as you're doing a deadlift, you want to make sure your chest always stays higher than your hip height, especially if you're using a weight because if your shoulders or chest drops to the same height as your hips or lower, then you're going to be using your lower back to do the lifting of your torso back up to an upright position. And our lower backs aren't made for that. And a lot of people have lower back issues and it can be caused by dropping your chest too low and asking our lower backs to do the work that our butt should be doing. A strong butt is crucial in our posture, as I've highlighted. And deadlifts are one of the best ways to develop butt strength. Now, when you're doing a deadlift, it's really important to remember that when you're doing that hip hinge, as you stand up, you're pushing your hips forwards. So your knees and hips are straightening at once, but you're not straightening upwards. You're like straightening and your hips push forwards to guide you back to standing straight because you're not allowing your butt to drop down low as you would in a squat. So with our deadlift, as we bend our hips and knees and hinge back with our hips, we want to breathe in. And then as we stand up, driving forward with our hips, we want to breathe out. You notice with all of these movements, I've incorporated breathing with them. That is because breathing is a really important way of generating tension in our body. And when we have tension in our body, two things, we're able to generate more tension. So tension builds tension, meaning that the more tension you have in the body, the more power and strength you can generate. But not only that, when we synchronize breathing with a movement, we're allowing our exhale to generate force in our torso. And that keeps our lower back safe. You see, when we breathe outwards, and I'm not talking like breathing out when you lift up, like blowing out a candle. We, we, don't, want to, we don't want to be like that. I'm talking when you breathe out, as you lift the weight up, you want to imagine that you're making a sound like a T, 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 because if you do it, you put your hand on your stomach and you go T, T, and your stomach tightens. And that's important because when our stomach tightens, it's got this built-in response. So our abdominals tighten and our back muscles tighten. And when everything's tightening there, when we're doing a um, an exertive movement where we're lifting a weight, it keeps our lower back safe. You see, our our core muscles are designed as like a built-in back brace for our spine in the area where our ribs aren't. So we want to make sure that we're putting our breath into alignment with how we're moving our body to keep our body as safe as we can. So what if for whatever reason you cannot do some of these movements? Well, not everyone can move their bodies the same. I totally get that. And if you are someone who can't move your body in a particular way, then there are still options for you. So let's start with the squat. Let's say you can't do the standing squat and you've tried it with a chair and that's still not working. What you can do is find a doorway, open the door, because you know, I can't stand in the doorway if it's closed. <laughs> you want to find a doorway and you want to stand there in the doorway facing one side of the frame uh, where you've got the, the kind of the trimming so you can kind of grip your fingers in behind the trimming on the door frame and you have your hands around chest height just gently gripping on the trimming behind there and what you can do is set your feet up for a squat so hip width or wider toes slightly outwards and as you bend your knees and hips and lower yourself down just walk your hands down the door frame Slow and controlled, get to as low as you can to be able to get back out of it. So push yourself back up, walking your hands back up. Really nice. It just gives you a little bit more stability. It will really help keep your chest up. Guaranteed, your chest will not drop if you're using the door frame to help guide your squat up and down. And that's really important. And it can help the movement feel a bit nicer. If you can't stand up, then you can go to quadruped or kneeling position. Four, four points of contact on the ground, quadruped. And what you can do... From, from hands and knees is one leg at a time. Just extend your legs straight back so that your heel is in line with your butt and then bring it back down to that bent knee starting point and then swap sides. Extend the leg out and bring it back in. If quadruped is not working for you, if hands and knees is not working for you, flip yourself over. You're going to lay on your back. You're going to take your hands 
uh, you're going to make like a little, like your thumbs come together and your pointer fingers come together and make that little diamond in your hands and you're going to lay your hands just under, between your lower back and your butt and just kind of support your lower back there. And what you can do from your back with your lower back supported by your hands, you're going to bend your knees so that you've got a 90 degree bend in your hip and a 90 degree bend in your knee. And holding one knee in that position, the other leg is going to extend out to straight. And then you're going to bend it back up to that 90 degree, 90 degree bend. 90 in the hip, 90 in the knee. And then you're going to swap sides, you're going to do the other leg. And you can alternate that way. You see those two movements in quadruped and laying down on your back are essentially a squat position, but without standing. So we're taking away gravity, which is taking away the challenge that it can give our joints if we're someone who is differently abled and it's allowing you to still get a similar movement in while having some support and some safety there if it comes to a push-up and you're feeling challenged because we all know push-ups are super super challenging and i did just point that out not too long ago <laughs> what we have as alternative is an incline push-up so you can use a wall tabletop, kitchen bench, or chair, so long as it's against something so it won't slide away. And you can set yourself up exactly the same. Go yourself out on an angle, hands under the shoulders, feet together, squeeze the butt, and you're just going to lower yourself down, keeping your elbows close to your ribs. Push yourself back up from whatever incline you feel comfortable to use. And you can breathe in as you go down, breathe out as you push up. So incline push-ups are a really cool way to start developing that strength. If that is still too much, you can go down to that quadruped position, hands and knees again, and you can do what is called a table push-up. So you're going to have hands under the shoulders, and all you're going to do, shifting some weight forward onto your hands, bend your elbows down, keeping them close to your ribs, pushing back up from there, but allowing your hips to and legs to support some of that body weight. So it's not full body weight, but you're starting to get used to that motion. So you've got a few good alternatives there. Yes. I love that. Making sure that if you're doing an incline push-up to keep your butt squeezed. If you're doing the um, table push-up, don't worry about squeezing your butt because your legs are going to be able to do that work for you. Now you're going to breathe in as you lower yourself down. You're going to breathe out as you push yourself back up. Well, let's get the abs. See, even if you are tucking your chin to your collarbones and you're still finding neck discomfort, what you can do is lay on your back and you're going to have your legs straight out. And you're going to do that little diamond with your hands again, so thumbs and pointer finger together. And you're going to support under your lower back. And with your straight legs, you can do it either one at a time or both of them together. You're just going to raise one leg straight up to so your foot is above your hip. And then you're going to lower it back down. And then you're going to swap sides, trying to keep both legs straight if you can. Um, but if you can't, don't stress about that. You are where you are. You'll get to where you get to. And that is okay. <laughs> and that's a great way to target some of your abdominals without really having to strain your neck or strain your upper body too much if you're feeling that's a little bit too challenging. So alternatively, you can do like a just a, sh a short plank if you're looking at getting some ab work in. That's a little bit less dynamic. Dynam by dynamic, I mean less movement. So you can hold a plank from your knees. Same thing. You're going to set yourself up like that push-up though. Hands always under the shoulders. Why? Because we're stacking our joints, which means we're putting one joint on top of the other, which is the strongest position for them to be in. Once we start coming wide of that, we start getting funny angles in our joints and that always ends up leading to trouble in the end. <laughs> so hands always under shoulders in conclusion <laughs> so let's go over what we've talked about today we've looked at the different training sessions that you can do that will give you different results we've looked at why knowing why you want to move your body and how to move your body can be really important with long term how you keep moving your body and we've looked at how to safely practice some of the most common exercises that you're going to find in training sessions on the socials at the moment. But you can find all these details in the show notes, so please don't think you've got to just remember everything right now. I gave you a lot of stuff. <laughs> so they will be in the show notes for you to have a read over in your own time. If you want to find out more about us or get in contact with us, you can go to www.fearlessmovement.co. You can find us on Facebook at Fearless Movement Collective, on Instagram at fearless underscore movement underscore co, or non-gendered fitness as non underscore gendered underscore fitness or me bowie at the dot no dot t dot nb yes if you have any questions for us if you want to hear something on a particular episode if you've got burning questions that you want me to answer on a show let us know i would love to be able to answer your questions <laughs> anything that you are thinking of please shoot us a message 
Also, if you feel like jumping onto Apple Podcasts or anywhere you get your podcasts and reviewing us, that would be Bonzo as well. We would love you for forever for that. <laughs> Until next week, remember, you are capable of great things. You just need to believe that you can do them. So work safely and within your limits. Remember, coordination and strength take time to develop. So be kind to yourself and patient as you learn these new skills. Have a right as day pass.